Our God in heaven, you're holy, perfect, righteous, and just. As we look and see the sinfulness of our own hearts, the injustice in the world around us, the confusion, the division, Lord, we have nowhere to look for hope but you. As we turn for these few minutes together to look at your word, Lord, we pray that you would speak, that you would make your message clear, that you would enable us to, to understand and then to obey what you've provided for us. Feed us from your word tonight, Father. Lord, speak to us, teach us, encourage us, rebuke us, and train us. We come asking through the blood of Christ. And we trust that you will do it and keep your promise. And again, in Jesus' name, amen. We spent a good bit of, I guess, last year and the first few minutes of this year before we got shut down and kicked out and tossed to the side uh, in the book of Colossians. I would like us to turn back there tonight to kind of jump back into our study. We'll do some review, uh, kind of get us, I don't know, how do you say it, get our feet wet, our engines revved, um, prime the pump, however you want to word it. Uh, but we will get back into the book of Colossians tonight. And, and it's fascinating as I was, to me, as it always is, when I open scripture and, I, and, I'm, and I'm preparing uh, throughout the week and even some of this for back in March, uh, I think was the last time we were in the book of Colossians together, but how the Lord put this message and the next in this day and time, uh, it is... An encouragement, it is a reminder that God's timing is, 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 is better, uh, his timing is best. Uh, it, it also will coincide with what I was, we were talking about in Sunday school this morning. Uh, it coincides with a, with a new series where I'm hoping to start with the youth on Wednesdays, uh, either this Wednesday or next, Lord willing, to, based on some timing of some things. But it, 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 it's as if the Lord is saying, uh, I've, I've got a message that I need delivered and you have the privilege of delivering it. So I thank the Lord for that. Uh, but before we get to that section, would you look with me at Colossians chapter 3? Uh, Colossians chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 1. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of verses, and then we're going to summarize, and then we're going to dig in deep to just a few words uh, in the approximately, what, hour and a half, two hours we have left. But if you'll read with me Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. We, we're, we're finding ourselves in that, in that position that Paul's letters always leave us, where he has given doctrine, instruction, and teaching, and then he kind of turns just a little bit and says, okay, now here's what you do with it. Uh, he has, in, you know, in, in Romans, it's really almost the first 11 chapters, he unleashes the fire hose of knowledge. Uh, in other books, it's, it's shorter. Colossians here, it's about halfway, where there is a lot of uh, application throughout, but he's really just teaching. He's, he's pointing to Christ. He's, he's laying Christ before us and saying, this is your Savior. This is your Creator. This is your Redeemer. And now he's, he's turning the page and saying, okay, now this is how it should affect your day to day, your moment by moment. And if you are then risen with Christ, so imagine you here the, the, the death, burial and, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ and then his resurrection. To those of us who have been forgiven of our sins, we have gone to him and we have, we have laid our sin at his feet and asked his forgiveness. And we've asked his pardon as the only one who has paid the penalty that we truly deserve. The, one who could, the only one who could pay it for us and not because of his own sin. When we have been forgiven, we are now resurrected with Christ. 
We have been risen with him. So if you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. He then says, set your affection, your thinking, your, 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 your heart's desires, the, your, your, your hopes and your dreams. Set it all on things above, not on things on the earth. It's take this, this, this uh, parallel uh, view of life and begin to look at it from an eternal perspective. If this is who Christ is, this is who you should be. And so as we read through these first few verses, we'll see you are risen with Christ, so seek those things above. He'll then say you are dead with Christ. Your life is hidden with Christ and God. You are now dead to your sin. You're dead to the old man. Uh, In verses 5 through 9, he says you're putting to death the deeds of the old man. Um. He gives us these these two thoughts of you have put off the old man and you've put on the new. And those are past tense verbs. Those are things that have happened. You've put off the old and now you have been, you have replaced it with the new man. It is as if you have taken off the old, nasty, disgusting work clothes and you have washed your, been washed and cleaned and now you have replaced them with new, clean, you know, fresh out of the dryer, smells like dryer sheets, amazing clothes. You, you, you've put off and now you have put on. It is past tense. But then he talks to us about putting to death the deeds of the old man, to continue continue in that habit of putting off the old desires, the old uh, cravings, the old selfishness, the old man. Put off the old, you have put on the new, now continue growing, putting to death the deeds of the old man. Matthew Henry said, it is our duty to mortify our members which incline to the things of the world, mortify them, kill them, suppress them as weeds or vermin which spread and destroy all about them. As I, as I thought, of, as I read that, I, I envisioned what I call a garden out in our yard, what it has produced a, a vast abundance of these amazing, sweet, delicious tomatoes, some, some cucumbers, a few jalapenos. I've, I, we've got a watermelon that's about that big, and I'm so excited and I, it, 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 because something ate all the little ones except two or three. And it's, I, I have the, pardon the, the, the language here, but the most redneck of fences around my garden to try to keep out what vermin have come after my watermelon. And I'm praying that they don't get to the cantaloupes, uh, which seem to be growing like wildflower. Anyway, that has nothing to do with anything. But don't let, please don't talk to my wife about the garden. She, she mocks it. She makes fun of it. She appreciates the produce, but it's ugly. She went out and said, I took a picture of the watermelon. I wish I could post it and show people, but your garden's ugly. It, it really is. It is. But this is the most productive garden I've ever had. So talk about its ugliness. I don't care. Um, but in the past, I have, I have gone out with the dream and I have a, a somewhat square section that is really good dirt. I mean, I have put anything and everything from my own kitchen scraps to, to, to expensive uh, uh, fertilizer, cheap fertilizer, uh, uh, some, some hummus, uh, hummus. I always think of hummus as the, the, the moss, peat moss. We'll go with that one. Uh, you know, we've put all of that in there. And, and, and over the years, I have even cut down old vegetation and, 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 and covered it. And so the, it, is, it is amazing. It, it really is a good producing soil after a lot of effort. But in my ignorant mind, a couple of years ago, I planted, everything was growing. It was amazing. We watered when we remembered and, and then it rained sometimes. And so the scraggles were trying but certain plants were overwhelmed by the weeds that went crazy in that garden. There are no weeds in my garden this year, okay? It might be ugly, but there's no weeds. But I thought about the weeds, and, and, and there's certain plants. I had some uh, just long, amazing pumpkin plants growing with. They were amazing, but the weeds just went crazy, and they're so hard to clean around because of the little tendrils that, that start to pull the weeds in, and it's, it, it becomes almost symbiotic, and it becomes a symbiotic disaster. That's not happening this year, okay? It's ugly, but it's working. But I thought of that. A mental picture. You are to be mortifying the deeds of the flesh. Uh, Verse uh, 5 says, mortify. Put to death, therefore, your members. And it says here, uh, again, let me read Matthew Henry's quote again because I love the intensity of it. It is our duty, duty to mortify our members which incline to the things of the world. Mortify them, kill them, suppress them as weeds or vermin which spread and destroy all about them. 
You have put off the old man. You have put on the new man. Now keep putting to death the, 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 that old man that keeps trying to creep back in. You've walked away from the sins of the past. You have been forgiven of those. You now have the grace of God that, that, that protects you from temptation, that empowers you in the face of temptation. Don't go back. Keep putting him to death. So you're risen with Christ. You're dead in Christ. You're putting to death the deeds of the old man through the power of Christ. You are being uh, renewed after the image of your creator, verse 10. Here's where we'll pick up. And having put on the new man, having put on in the past, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You, you are being renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. For a minute here, let's just pause on this word here. Renewed, being made new. This is a continual process. The old man has been put off. He has been replaced. But you are going to still have to fight temptation. Don't ever forget, you have three major enemies. It is the world, it is the devil, but it's also your own flesh constantly under uh, uh, attacking you, trying to pull you back. We, 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 we have been sin-cursed, and we live in a sin-cursed world. Temptation abounds. So keep putting that to death, turning from it. And while put off and put on have happened at salvation, there is a process of, of, of growth, process of sanctification, a process of enduring the temptations that come, even considering them to, to, to an extent, a reason for joy because those temptations and, and the fight against those temptations builds patience, builds endurance, builds steadfastness. So keep in the fight, but you are being renewed, made new. Second Corinthians, we know this. It comes to mind. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, behold. <laughs> it's as Paul was writing. He said, whoa, whoa, behold, listen. That's how we say it. He, he said, behold. Uh, we say, hey, stop and listen. Behold. Stop and consider. All things are becoming new. This work is being done. There is a parallel passage. If you've ever read Ephesians and Colossians within uh, any kind of short time length, you'll say, wait, didn't he just say this? Oh, yeah, he said it over here. And you, and you can kind of go back and forth, back and forth, and you'll see the, 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 the many parallels. And in, in a parallel in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, and you have put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Here in Colossians it is, you have put on the new man and you are being renewed after the image of your creator, after the image of, into the image of your creator, after the image of Christ. You're, you're being transformed in knowledge. Ephesians, it says, in righteousness and true holiness. So we come to the understanding, looking at both of these, these verses here, that this, this renewal, this recreation is a complete change of nature, of our thinking, of our behavior, and, and, and our position in, in, in God's eyes. The, the true holiness, righteousness, and in knowledge. We are not restored to a position of a naive and a sinless Adam. We are not made like the first Adam, at, at, at this recreation, our salvation. We're not made like him. We are made like the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. When God looks at us and sees our forgiveness, he doesn't see an image of the old Adam before his sin. He sees the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees his own son, the sinless lamb of God. That's how God sees us. And that's what he's trying to change us into. He's renewing our minds and he's renewing us to righteousness and true holiness. Because of this work done in us, God does not see, a, again, a pre-fall Adam, but a post-resurrection Jesus. It is the righteousness and true holiness of Christ that he sees in our place. As a believer, when God looks at us, he does not see our sin anymore. He doesn't see our past. He doesn't see our mistakes. He doesn't see our foolishness. He doesn't see our weakness. He sees Christ. But we're still in the process of being changed into that image of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a continually, daily, moment-by-moment moment work that God is doing. This work of recreation does not only change how God sees us, but it also changes how we see God and the world around us. 
and, and think of this. I was reminded uh, at a professor in college who, 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 who regularly, it seems, had a, had a way of bringing this into every class I took with him, but he, was a, he did a lot of counseling classes, teaching us to, to, to be good counselors with the Word of God. But he, he gave us what he often referred to as the four stabilizing truths. I'm going to give them to you real quick, but there's one in particular I want you to remember. This is stuck with me. God's love for me is unchanging. God's purpose for me is Christ-likeness. God's word for me is the final right answer. And God's uh, grace for me is always sufficient. But I, I, I have not, in, in, in all of the years from having heard him say that uh, many times, have never forgotten when times get hard, God's purpose for me is Christ-likeness. When times are going well, God's purpose for me is Christ-likeness. That is his goal. That is what he's doing. When he provides in ways that, I, that I've asked and, 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 and hoped and dreamed, and he fulfills those hopes and those dreams, he's saying, I am making you more like Christ, and this is going to help. When he says, no, I've got something better for you. Even if it's painful, his purpose for me is to make me like Christ. That is my goal. That is why I was created. I was created and, and, and rescued from my sin and my rebellion to look like, to imitate, to live like Jesus Christ. That's the work that he did and the work he's continuing to do. So God's purpose for me is always Christ-likeness. Don't be conformed to this world, Paul said, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We just read Colossians 3, uh, verses 1 and 2. If, you've, if you have then been risen with Christ, or since you have been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affection on those things, looking to Christ, focusing on Christ. Hebrews 12 tells us running the race with our, with our minds focused on Christ, who is the author and completer of our faith. Colossians chapter 1, verses uh, 9 and to about 12 or 13, Paul gives a prayer. If you want to look at Colossians chapter 1 real quick, for most of this, probably a turn of the page, click at the button, swipe of the screen, however you want, to, you want to do it. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And in praying for you, we desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us qualified or meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Paul lays out his purpose for Colossians, in the, the Colossian believers in this prayer, that you might be filled with the knowledge of God's will, with all understanding, uh, so that you might walk worthy of the Lord, that you might be Christ-like. That's the goal. That's the purpose. That's the plan. When things are, are dark, rest confident in that God is doing the best thing for you to make you more like his son, which is what you were created for in the first place. This isn't an afterthought. God did not create us. We rebelled. And then he thought, well, maybe if I made him more like Jesus. We were created to be like Jesus. That was the purpose. That was the plan. That was why he gave us life. That's why we have that choice to accept or rebel. His desire for us is that we be like Christ. And so as we continue reading, we, 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 we're, we're looking and, and, and how, apt, uh, how timely is it that as we read, um, look again with me in verse 10, and you've put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Most of us, you can, the way the, the translators of whichever translation you have came to the understanding that that wasn't the end of the sentence, even though we have the verse number there, and it continued on. So think about this. Hey, you have put on the new man, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ, who is all 
and in all. So he says, as you're being renewed in your knowledge, renewed to look more like Jesus, remember that there is not Greek or Jew. There is not, so we, you, you remember from way back, what, seven years ago, it seems like before Corona, when we were in this, that Paul was writing to believers who were facing a, a, a strange mix uh, of Christianity, the Judaic, uh, Ju, uh, Judaism, the law, attaching the law, Eastern mysticism, and it's this just weird conglomeration of, of religious ideas to, to, to build a new, in a, to their, under, to their, to their uh, what they called a better way, a, a fuller knowledge. They, they've, they've just kind of picked and choose what, chose what they like, put it together, said this is what we believe. So he's talking to a people who, who have an understanding of what it means to be Jewish and not. He talks circumcision and uncircumcision. And there's probably so much here that, that, could, that, that could give us a, a clear understanding. But he's talking to people who some have kept the law. Even Paul talked about how he kept the law to the, to the point that, that if anybody deserved salvation, it really was Paul. But even that wasn't enough. And he's also talking to people who have been told, you've got to keep and adhere to these standards and this law. If you want the full knowledge of God, if you want God's favor, you've got to keep these parts of this law. And Paul's saying, I'm not real concerned here with your previous adherence to the law. I'm not real concerned with your, with your previous spiritual upbringing. What matters is you have turned from all of that to Christ, and Christ is enough. He then says barbarian. I thought this was interesting, supposedly, in the etymology of this word, that the Greeks thought that, that people who didn't speak Greek were just saying bar, 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 bar. Makes sense, right? So barbarian. I thought that was interesting. little nugget that means very little, but it's neat. Um, trivia. But it's the uneducated. It's the non-Greek. It's those who don't live in this, the, the way our culture expects you to live. You're, you're, you're not like us. It has this word, Scythian. This was barbaric barbarians. These were savages. This was a feared nomadic group that were hated because of their attacks, because of their evil, because of their savagery. And yet these uneducated non-Greeks, these barbaric savages, the, the Scythians, probably had converts in these churches that had walked away from that and accepted Christ. And Paul is saying, that's the past. That is gone. That is over. We don't look and see that anymore. We don't look and say, well, you know, you used to be that. So that's forgiven. It's in the past. We don't look at culture and say, well, culturally speaking, we're so different. We can worship the same God, but maybe we should do it separately because it's, it's culture. Paul's saying, set that aside. Look at this last one. He says, bond nor free. Social and economic barriers don't matter when it comes to the gospel. We live in a, in a day and age that has seen the, the, the for the most part, the, the, the abolishment of slavery. And, and you'll hear people say, okay, well, if you go into the scripture times and you look at their form of slavery, it wasn't like the chattel slavery of the American past, uh, American history. It was different. Okay. And there was still this you're just a slave. You're just a, uh, uh, basically, you work for, to, to survive. That's all you are. Um, basically a, a tool. You're just a living tool to get jobs done. But yet, go back and read James. Look at the churches that Paul is preaching to. And what do you have sitting in the same congregation? Bond and free. Philemon and Onesimus. You say, who, what, huh? Go back and read Philemon. And then find, find uh, Philemon and Onesimus' names in Paul's letters. Slaveholder and a slave. And Paul says, stop looking at that. You're now brothers in Christ. That's more important than your socioeconomic situation. And so I, 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 I find it appropriate that this is where we land. We, we live in, in, in a time where it's, well, you don't believe politically the way I do. Shut up. 
This is your brother in Christ. Find that commonality and work together to fix the problems and the injustices. Well, you don't worship the same way I do. Let's sit down. Let's talk about theology. Let's talk scripture. This is our God. This is our Savior. These are the, these are the non-negotiables. And we agree. Let's work together to share the gospel. We, we, we don't share the same culture and the same language. We can fix that. We can work around that. So being renewed in your knowledge as a believer uh, brings you to the point that you see Christ and you see only Christ and you see the work of Christ and, and you set aside those cultural barriers that, that hinder us, those, those economic barriers that hinder us, those, those skin color barriers that, that, that hinder us. And, and, and it may be a, a need to give forgiveness or accept forgiveness. It may be the need to, to confess but there's no Greek or Jew. There's no circumcision or uncircumcision. There's no Barian. There's no barbarian. There's no Scythian. There's no bond or free. But Christ is all and in all. Just a couple of months ago in April, there was a villager from a tiny little village in Ecuador that passed away. And you might be like, well, that probably happened today and yesterday. And, and, and for the most part, none of us would know his name means nothing. Except there was a, a young man who got to know him and began to call him grandfather. Grandfather. And this young, somewhat wealthy American referring to grandfather, this villager who couldn't pass, count past 20 with his hands and toes, didn't understand numbers past that. It was after 20, it's lots, <laughs> and then lots and lots. That's how uneducated this grandfather was. And as, we, and as you, you stop and you're like, okay, so where's this going? What, what are you talking about? Let's go back just a few more years, about 60 years ago. Five American missionaries working to meet the most savage tribe in Ecuador were speared to death by that tribe. Within months, their families, surviving family members, were able to get in and, if we can use the gospel term, infiltrate those tribes and to share the gospel. And when Nate Saint, the pilot who flew them in, when his son went back to his Aunt Rachel's funeral in the 90s, he met Minkea. Minkea, who speared his father to death, and recognized the power of the gospel in Minkea's life and claimed him as his own grandfather. That's the power of the gospel. When Minkea, who, can't, who couldn't count past 20, who, 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 whose speech was almost an unintelligible because of his uneducated background, had the privilege of being taken and, and given an opportunity to share the gospel of what the creator had done for him and forgiving him and, and, and banishing his sin, removing that sinfulness from him, taking the dark, angry, furious savageness out of him. The power of the gospel is effective. Could you call grandfather the one who speared your father to death? Absolutely, because the gospel is that powerful. Put on, therefore. Look at verse 12. When there's a therefore, stop and look. Okay, what are we talking about? We're talking about having put, on the old, put off the old man, putting on the new, continuing to be renewed in knowledge towards righteousness and holiness. We'll borrow that, those, verses, that, those words from Ephesians in that parallel passage. Considering that's what's being done, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Stop there for a second. He's talking to believers, and he says, as the chosen of God, as those who've been redeemed, rescued, those who are risen with Christ, dead to sin and alive in Christ. And then he, there's a comma for most of us, and it says, holy and beloved. That's how God sees you. That's what he tells them. 
You've been fighting and squabbling over all these other things. You've been attacked and, and almost convinced to, to add the law, this Eastern mysticism. You've, you've been taught to, to take the portions of the Christianity that were comfortable and fit with your doctrine and your philosophy. And you've been, you, you've been attacked by this. And it's been laid on you. And that burden of, uh, of the law and works has been set on your shoulders. But stop and remember that you are holy, not because of your work, but because of the work of Jesus Christ. And you are beloved, not because of anything you could ever do, but in spite of everything you've done. Therefore, put on bowels of mercies, tender mercies, deep compassion. Put on kindness. Put on humility of mind, an accurate understanding of who yourself, who you are, uh, understanding of, of, of your past and what God has done for you. Put on meekness. Put on long-suffering, forbearing one another, bearing each other's annoyances, bearing each other's abuses, and forgiving one another. If any of you have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. You're being renewed into the image of Christ. What greater picture is there of Jesus than this? Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, loving one another, above all. Verse 13, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, even if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Verse 14, and above all these things, put on charity. I think if I remember right, I heard somebody say that charity is love with work clothes on. It's love in action. It's love that's willing to, to not just talk love, but be love, do love, to give, to, to work, to bear the burdens of another. Put on charity, the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be thankful, letting the peace of God rule in your hearts, letting that be the deciding factor, the, the umpire in the decisions of your life, the peace of God. If we are to be renewed in the knowledge of who Christ is, we are being cre recreated to, to righteousness and true holiness. If we are being not conformed to the world around us, but transformed by the renewing, the, re the re renovating of our minds, put on, therefore, compassion, love, care, concern. In spite of Jew or Greek, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, bond, free, in spite of all of that, put on love. Care for one another. Love for one another. What wrongs could have been prevented if the church had recognized this overwhelming and sufficient grace of God that is equally available to all men? What wrongs could have been prevented if God's people lived in such a way that saw God's hatred for my sin forgiven and pardoned by the work of Christ? If God can forgive me, how can I not forgive somebody else? If God can look past my mutiny and my rebellion, how can I not look past the cultural differences in the skin colors of my friends, of my neighbors? What hinders us from being like Christ? We want to talk about the and blame the world and the devil, but it's really the flesh that gets in the way because it's, it's about me, it's about my comfort, it's about my desires, it's about my hopes, my dreams. But as Jesus said, everything aside, he didn't see his deity as something to be held on to and, and, and coveted, but laid everything aside, emptying himself and taking on the form of a servant, even, even taking on the death on a cross he might put my sin on 
his shoulders, that God the Father would turn his back. When, when, when Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The first time in eternity that that bond, that bond was broken. God turned his back on my sin that was on the Lord Jesus Christ. How can I not turn my back to my own selfishness and, and, and desires and hopes and dreams to, to love and to care for and to serve somebody in need around me so that I might look like Jesus and show them Jesus. If the church could learn to love like Jesus, how would this world be so much better and so much different? I don't, I don't say that in an attempt to blame the church, but could we not do something better? Can we not do something more? Because it's an individual thing, putting off, putting on. But when he turns to, to this thought, it, 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 there's also this understanding of a, of a corporate response. And we need to provoke one another to good works, to this kind of love. Lord Jesus, as you have loved me, teach me to love. As you've forgiven me, teach me to forgive. Lord, we need you desperately. We love you. We really do. We love the, what you've done for us. We love the forgiveness you've made available. We love the power that you put in our hands to resist sin, sin and temptation, and to say no to the flesh. But we are also weak and easily distracted and easily tempted, and we so desperately need your grace to remind us, your mercy to protect us, your compassion to come and overwhelm us, Father, thank you. Thank you for sending your son. We do love you. And we ask praying all this through Jesus' name. Amen.